Artist talk for our scene exhibition, and I am so excited about this exhibition. I'm so excited to have these artists here with us. I'm Katie Bradford Osborne. I am the founder and curator of Roaring Artist Gallery. We are a fully virtual art gallery that exhibits exclusively the work of women identifying in non-binary artists. And uh, I'm so excited. So today we have Pierre Cherk, Kaylee Aldrich and Dina Page Fisher. And we're going to be starting with you, Sapira. So I will read your bio and then I'm going to hand it right over to you. All right. Sapira Chirk is an ink painter and installation artist, born in Hong Kong and based in Las Vegas, Nevada. Chirk's work often utilizes a blend of, of Sumi and India ink, symbolizing the mixture of her identities. Chirk has exhibited in numerous exhibitions, including those at the Institute of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, Orange County Contemporary Art Center, Center for Contemporary Art Texas, Master Museum, the Natura Museum, and Yellowstone Art Museum. Chirk serves as the art editor for the Museum of Americana and occasionally teaches at the University of, ne of Nevada, Las Vegas. She received her BA at University of Colorado Riverside and MFA from California State University, San Bernardino. All right, and I will hand it over to you. Hi, everyone. It's always awkward to like have your bio read like right in the beginning, but yeah, it's like, oh, I'm gonna sit here and listen to when you talk. Anyway, so um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, thank you, Katie and Rory artist gallery um, for hosting. I'm really thankful that I was included. Um, so again, my name is Sapir Chirk. My pronouns are she, her. I am calling from Las Vegas, Nevada, um, which is the ancestral homeland of the Southern Paiute. Um, so I'm going to go and start from the beginning um, of this talk. I'm going to talk about where I'm from and how that really influenced my current art practice. So um, I was born in Hong Kong in the 80s. That's little me right now with standing next to my mom. Um, so I was a terrible, terrible student. Um, and I was just terrible academically. And um, my parents were really, really worried about how I'm going to support myself if like I was bad at school. I wasn't going to go to college. And then I would just have like a failed life. But I was good at art. So they really encourage um, that for me as a hobby. And this is me in Hong Kong. I won like my first art award. My mom was so proud. We took a picture. Um, and then from there, I we immigrated to Honolulu, Hawaii when I was 10 years old. But my dad, um, he stayed back in Hong Kong and he didn't immigrate with us. So every summer um, during middle school and high school, we would fly back to Hong Kong and spend the summer with him. And during those summers, um, they would send me and my brother, that's me, being really awkward right there, and my brother, um, to um, private art lessons. And that was one of the more influential, influential teachers in my life. Um, he was a traditional um, Chinese brush painter and a printmaker as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But after, after, so I have a bachelor in art, but I never told my parents that I studied art in college. Like I just, I thought, I seriously thought they were going to disown me. And they already moved, like my mom had moved back to Hong Kong. So it, it was this like really awkward time um, of me telling them I study accounting instead. And I was going to, you know, tell them, you know, I, I actually study art as my undergrad, um, when they came to my graduation, they 
they flew and then I had family, other family come from Hong Kong and like folks from all over the place, they were going to watch me graduate. Um, and I was a first generation college student. So it was a big deal for them. Um, and I was like getting up the courage to tell them, um, but they walk, uh, I was walking on stage, but, and everybody was late. So they had announced the college of where these graduates were from. And then I saw my family walk in and heard my name being read, but they had totally missed what college these graduates were. And I didn't tell them until like way later. I'd be like, yeah, they were asking me like, why aren't you an accountant yet? I'm like, um, actually I studied art that whole four years. Um, but anyways, it worked out fine. <laughs> so um, it, this is a story where I, where I try to give up art multiple times in my life because I had all this family pressure to get like a real job, whatever that meant. Um, so I actually spent 10 years um, working for the California government and kind of cultivating my own art practice after work. I actually went to grad school while I worked full time. I was an analyst. Um, and then finally, I've transitioned out of that role and now I work full time in, in various artist fields. Um, so long story short, um, I came to art in, a, in like in a roundabout way, even though it was a really big part of my life. Um, so I'm going to talk about the materials first because it's really, um, really important in my practice, really core in my practice. So in the bio that Katie had just read, um, I am an ink and paper painter um, and all the inks that are in my work are a specific blend of non-soluble and soluble inks. So you can see here that some of them are, when they interact with each other, some sometimes they fracture and sometimes there's a really nice gradation. Um, and I use a blend of Chinese Sumi ink and um, India ink, which I associate with Western art practice because that's how I, the ink that I would use in ink drawing when I was going through school or, or learning calligraphy. Um, so, so that really also symbolized like all the things that I take in and then put out because I have this, I have this traditional Chinese ink painting background as well as this very very Western um, uh, ideolo ideology and like conceptual framework for my work, and I I, I think about those things um, all the time how they're how sometimes they work together and sometimes how they contrast and differ. Um, so that is really the material. And I also want to mention that a lot of my work centers around knowledge that you gain or understanding you gain through, through experience and through your body and not so much um, something that you read or something that you were taught. So really like nonverbal experience and communication. Um, a good way to think about it is like your gut feeling like, oh, I had a bad gut feeling. And then later on, you realize why you had that gut feeling. And like the logic hasn't caught up, the language hasn't caught up to explain what you were going through, what you were understanding. And I'm really interested in that very in uh, nonverbal space. And that's where the paintings come from. Um, I'm going to share two series before I, I talk about the work that is in the show because it really leads up to um, the work you see in this exhibition. So I'm going to go and share. This is my website. I'm going to talk about how they do really quickly. So this is a series that I created in 2020. Um, right in the middle of quarantine. It's called How They Do in the Time of Quarantine. So when uh, when we were all stuck in the house, I was so happy because I got to make work all day, every day. All my plans were canceled. I don't have to be in school teaching. Like it was magic for me. Um, and I think I made like a blanket statement, like artists are having the best time because they're in their studio. But that really wasn't the case when, we when I talked with like performance artists, especially dancers and folks that play in band, they just couldn't do what they did, what they do. Um, so this came about and I put out a call for dancers from all over the world to just film themselves dancing wherever they're quarantined. So how they do is a step of two in ballet. You need two people for this dance. And I would combine um, stills from all the videos and put them in one composition as if they're dancing 
together in the same space. So it was a really great project. And it was really about like, how do you connect in, in this time? How do you reach someone um, that's really going through the same thing? Um, so here we have folks from uh, somebody from Greece and Uganda and dancing with somebody in Uganda and then somebody in Arizona dancing with someone from Spain. Um, but it was great because this project was about trying to connect when you couldn't connect. And then um, one of the dancers in this project actually choreographed a performance based on this work um, that was just performed in Kennesaw State University. So that was really a great transition for this project. Um, and then during the same year, I'm gonna go and talk about Align Parallel. This work visually is very similar to the work that you see in this exhibition. Um, it is painted on Duralar and it's a semi-translucent material. And I painted a figure on one side and the other on the other side. And it looks like they're in the same space. So there's themes of being in the same, in, in Pa They Do, they're like very separate, but on uh, in the same plane uh, on the canvas or in the picture plane. And here is more like a, like a connection or like you're in the same frame of mind when you're placed on the same, um, same paper. Um, so I was really, so, okay. So I'm going to talk about a lot of medical stuff that I was going through. Um, it, it's so, it's so funny when you're like an artist and you make work about like yourself and you have to like super open, but okay. So, so in 2020, I had a diagnosis and it was the wrong diagnosis. And I had it for a year. They diagnosed me with type two diabetes but really my pancreas stopped working. So I had type one diabetes, but okay. So in 2020, um, I was very, very sick and they were giving me all the wrong medications. Um, and I was, and we were still kind of reeling from the quarantine. And we, it, this was before this body of work was made before we had a vaccine. Um, and a lot of folks were going through a lot of really difficult things. And um, we were able to connect in a very different way um, through trauma. And uh, and when I say trauma, it doesn't have to be like a big thing. It could be like a small trauma that you don't know was big until later on, like, your like again, like it's the body knowing before you make sense of what happened or understand what you were going through. Um, and I was really interested in the idea of fibroblasts, which is commonly known as your scar tissue. And I was creating the experience of going through trauma as fibroblasts because it's your scar tissue is actually not skin. It's something completely different. And they're even formed in a different way. Your skin is formed in a crisscross diamond pattern, but because the scar tissue needs to cover an area quickly, they aligned parallelly. That's why it's called aligned parallel. Um, and and like we think of it as skin and you see someone with a scar, like I have a scar on my neck. Um, I had cancer when I was really little. But like you think, oh, that person went through something and they must be stronger because they had survived. Um, but scar tissue is actually weakened in, you know, actual skin because they had to form quickly. And like, it's the same thing of like thinking about how um, you might not come out stronger. You might just be living through. You might, you're, it's just a, it's, you just live through. It doesn't mean like you came out better or stronger very much. There's like a duality of how we see scars and like how we interpret hate. Um, so these work all are, have this piece of tape that I've used on one side and the other side to kind of um, signify the trauma that the body had went through and how recognize that in the other person in the other side, like um, I'll show you in this one, there's a scar here and it's the same piece of tape that was used on the other side of the other body. Like you, there's an instant recognition of the same experience that you went through and there's a connection that you're able to make through the, that experience. Um, so I take this work and I move it to the work that you see in this exhibition. I'm gonna go in now. Um, and this work is probably the most personal work that I have made in a long time. Um, this work is titled, sorry, Family Tides. And um, so 
again, when I was finally properly diagnosed and on the right treatment, my doctor was working with me um, to find out all of my family medical history. And because of, I had immigrated and I haven't lived with my immediate family, like we weren't on the same continent since 2007, like I really missed out on a lot of time with family. Um, and that time with family, you would hear stories of what other folks are going through. So I missed a lot of connection and time with my, not only my immediate family, but my, also my extended family. My mom is one of 12. So we have a really, really big extended family and going through. Um, so, okay. So here's the, here's how this work came about. Um, I was asked to find out, you know, all the stuff about my family and all of their cancer history, all of um, their diabetes and other medical things that they had to go through. It's like, a, I don't know, it's a four page document. And I had to call my mom and ask her. And this work really came out of that conversation of like me realizing how I was, I was not able to connect with family and I was able to connect with them now through this work because I had, I didn't realize all the things that they were going through and they didn't realize all the things that I was going through, even though we share in, in my brain, like we share the same blood. Um, and I'm not going to be able to talk about this work in a very eloquent way because these are all the feelings that I'm still working through. This is an ongoing series. So I'm going to stop here. And I'll show you the other one too. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, I, um, first of all, I really loved hearing everything about your work. Um, I'm really interested and in, my practice deals with the body a lot too. So I was interested in your paint application and like the importance of the pure white background um, and how you get kind of these incredibly clean lines with this kind of airy quality within the figures themselves. Um, so I was just wondering how you ensure that that kind of cleanliness around the with the negative space around the figures happens. Yeah, so I'll talk about the logic of the of all the work first. In like even in like more abstract work, the ink is still the body that occupies the space. So the white paper is really like the context mm -hmm. of 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 the work. Um, but I actually paint with water first, and then I put the ink on. Um, so it's really practice here. Um, in working on dural R, you can kind of like erase the, mm -hmm. the ink using alcohol. So you're able to get like really nice clean lines with that. Cool. This is kind of more of a comment, but I really like resonated with what you said about the language within the body and like something that's nonverbal, but just like inherently within the body. And I love how your pieces almost look like writing as well as human forms they sort of like unravel into this abstract sort of language or even look like they're like language made up into this form um so I I definitely felt that thank you thank you yeah I feel like we all make uh, like our we develop our own visual language because our verbal language is not enough to tell that story. Yeah. I'm always saying that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why, why make work if I can just write it? Like, yeah. yeah. That's a good, that's a good question. I like that. That's really a fascinating comparison. And you said you have a background in calligraphy. Um, no, I don't. I, I have a background in Chinese brush painting, which is very much tied to it's tied to calligraphy, but like if you ask me to write Chinese calligraphy, it would just be atrocious. <laughs> I think this is, I, I can really see that in these pieces. I agree that you sort of get that 
almost like your own language type thing. And um, they're very eloquent and they're very beautiful. And I, uh, I loved hearing about the other two series as well. That's Thank you so much for sharing these with us. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Pierre, thank you so much for sharing with us. Do you have anything else that you wanted to mention before? No, just thanks for having me. Awesome. All right. Well, next up we have Kaylee Aldrich. Kaylee, I'm going to read your bio and then I'll hand it over to you. Great. Kaylee Aldrich was born in Buffalo, New York and graduated in 2021 with her BFA from Alfred University School of Art and Design in the New York State College of Ceramics with minors in business administration, arts management, and dance. Growing up in the performing arts and martial arts, Kaylee always had an interest in performance and the body. Working now with painting and dance, she has exhibited work multiple times on campus at Al Alfred University, as well as at California State University the Jan Mateko Univer Academy of Fine Arts in Krakow, Poland, and the University of Saskatchewan, Canada, during the Verso Recto International Print Exchange. Kaylee also studied abroad in Barcelona, Spain for two weeks at Art Print Residency doing copper plate etchings. She has also performed in numerous dance pieces for Alfred University Dance Theater, as well as choreographing three pieces, including a solo. She continues to make work in Buffalo. All right, Kaylee, I'm excited to hear how all of this comes together and <laughs> what you're doing. That's really cool. All right, handing it over to you. All right, let me get my presentation up. Um, I don't normally use Google. Uh, how do you present the slide um over towards the right this one oh you got it here we go yeah. okay <laughs> all right perfect thank you so much katie for that introduction um and thank you to Roaring artist gallery for allowing me to be a part of this with such amazing artists um and i'm excited to talk about my work today with you all so yes uh to build off some of that background that Katie provided, um, I'll give some insight into the beginnings of my work before I ever picked up a paintbrush. So I was a very shy kid um, and my parents heard from my kindergarten teacher that she didn't heard me speak for a few months. So they, I mean, that was a hyperbole, but they decided to break me out of my shell by putting me into Taekwondo when I was six. Um, and I was also put into dance when I was two. So. I was already starting my life in movement in two very classically gendered um, spaces, one very masculine with martial arts and one very feminine. And uh, while there's nuance in both of those movement practices, uh, I'm taking largely from the whole of the ways in which it was presented to me as a kid. So um, in martial art movement, the movement is direct, it's clear, it's assertive, and there's a target. There's an end to a punch. There's a target, uh, someone's body or a board. Um, and it's very much everyone in the class is doing something together to make and emphasize that assertiveness and clarity even more. You slap your sides to attention, you shove your fist down for a ready, and then you go to fighting stance and complete the movement. Martial arts, you're watching the body perform and execute different skills. Dance, it's difficult. While, while it's difficult, the idea of dance classically, there's a lot of different kinds of dance and dances for everybody. But generally in America, you're put into dance. Generally, it's all girls. If, it, if there's boys in your class, they're, they're given different movements because they can't dance like girls dance and they often will be in weird roles like I was three and I had a marriage dance um, with like the three boys in our class so it's very classically feminine um, and while dance itself is difficult to execute the moves you're trying to do it in a way that looks as effortless as possible you're supposed to look dainty and light even though you're soaring your whole body through the air you're trying to land with no sound and everything has a perfect end to, from your fingertips to your toes um, you're quite literally wearing a thing called tights. You're wearing skin tight leotards and the room is full of mirrors where everyone is attempting to look the same. When you watch dance, you're watching how beautiful the body looks doing the movement. It's not so much just watching the finished end of a movement, like how hard a punch was, for example. You're looking at the body in general and how beautiful it looks as it moves. Um, so 
those different threads kind of informed my early knowledge of how to move in the body. And then being a girl growing up, you're taught that the classically masculine parts of movement are not for you. You're not supposed to yell like you are in Taekwondo class. Um, every time you kick, you're not supposed to um, run around and punch things and be aggressive in any way. That's not how little girls play. That's how little boys rough house. So um, going into college and throughout my life, I kind of had threads of those, but I stopped doing Taekwondo once I got a black belt at age 11 and was on and off with dance. But college was really a time where I got unknowingly, I was gonna be thrown back into those things. Um, so as Katie mentioned, I was a dance minor at my university and it was a very different program than what I was used to. It included a global perspective of dance history. Um, it introduced me to dance as art and modern dancers and uh, how to choreograph on yourself, not just to like standard pop music for a recital. Um, and really dropped uh, sexualization of dance, which is sadly new <laughs> to me as a lot of dance growing up is. And I was taking a class about bodies um, and it, from a kind of philosophical lens. And we read an article about women doing martial arts for the first time and how it kind of allowed them to tap into that um, assertiveness and aggressiveness and certainty within their bodies that could help transform their lives um, by speaking up or standing up for things that they want to say without any kind of apprehension. And at the end of class, we brought in a boxing expert and he taught us some the six punches. And it felt really familiar in my body and I, and I really loved it. So continuing on in my university, I started a club and I was boxing like twice a week, um, teaching a bunch of different people. So in that time, long story short, back to the, onto the work now, the painting on the left is one of the earliest paintings I ever did about this topic. Um, I, in this painting, I only wanted to focus on how can I solve the kind of question of how can I put movement into a 2D surface? And I was really inspired by boxing at the time because it just, it just came back into my life pretty largely. So um, I was using techniques of collage here, using different materials, cutting it up, putting, putting it back on. Um, and abstracting the body through cutting the shapes, but also painting shapes um, using different colors and the colors to also add vibrancy to the work itself to kind of add that movement. Um, and this was a big breakthrough for me and I was really inspired to keep pushing this idea. So a few paintings later, I made the one on the right and just for context of scale to um, the painting on the left is two feet by four feet and then the painting on the right is on wood and it's four feet by four feet. So the painting on the right kind of works to play again with how do I create movement, but this time just with paint. Um, and because it was bigger vertically, it really allowed me to have a more embodied practice as I painted. I was going up and down, painting on the floor, mixing my palette, standing back up, and like an arc wouldn't just be something small at a desk, but it was more in, into the actual movement as I was painting it, because I found if I'm gonna paint movement, I should be, moving my body um, to get authentic gestures onto the surface. And this, the painting on the right was really about color play too, which becomes really integral to my practice as well. Uh, every color I put down, I just stepped back and said, okay, how can I make it more vibrant? What would be surprising and what would be more, um, add more contrast and just to kind of push with that kind of vibrating uh, look that you get as a viewer. So I kept playing with that. And then a few paintings later, I got to this one um, called The Second in a Year. It is four feet by seven feet. So again, continuing to push scale, which is something I found I really loved. Um, and this painting was interesting to me because I just tried to make a cluster of people. And um, when I had people look at it, they all thought of different things like a cocktail party or a cruise ship boat or like just a jumble of people on the street. And uh, I liked that this painting started to teach me about how space could affect and scale could affect the interpretation of the work. And uh, so as you step back, more figures might disappear or come forward versus when you get up close, you might see some other things or maybe the shapes get more abstracted and they just become more shape-like rather than figure-like. Uh, so I kind of found here again, I know how to do movement now in this one way and kind of create this busyness, but um, how can I push that further? 
So um, that brings me to this painting called Here to Make You Look. And this was a few months later um, where I kind of figured out, okay, here's how I can break down the body into shapes, how I can break down space, but I really want to get it back to the concept that originally started with this. Um, and I knew I wanted to do a painting that revisited the gestures of martial arts and boxing uh, and assertive gestures in general with the color pink. I knew I wanted to make a pink painting because I never really painted with pink too much before. Um, and pink is gendered to be feminine and dainty and not powerful, um, at least now. So I wanted to make a really powerful in your face painting. Uh, that has this airiness to it and kind of allows light and allows you to look in while these figures are literally kicking back at you or um, punching. Um, and so here I was also experimenting with the space around the figures with how can I make it not so solid. So I was playing more with drips and glazes um, and having a different surface to paint on a lot of that. So previously mentioned, the paintings I've shown before have all been on wood panels. I don't paint on canvas because it tends to be too absorbent for the kind of painting I like to do. So wood kind of helped with that, but it still absorbed too much paint no matter how much gesso is. So this is actually on masonite. Um, and I paint like four layers of gesso and then I just, the painting can just drip right off and it's extra white to have that vibrancy to it, um, which I really enjoy. And it has the weight to kind of hold the oil paint. Um, so this painting was really uh, a big, another turning point and kind of the midpoint of this thesis that I was then working on. Uh, I wanted to show this just as a kind of insight into my process. This is a current painting I have in progress right now um, in my studio. So I always start with kind of a formal idea and then a memory or a conceptual idea. And then I, I did dance throughout college as well, as I mentioned. So I would normally kind of, to get that into my body, I would think on that I'd maybe read about or write about how I'm feeling. And then I might take like a few minutes to figure out how that would feel in the body and um, just try to, in silence, generate some movement around it to get some ideas of gesture. And then I'll just take light, light washes of paint and start sketching figures across the canvas, playing with scale, um, having them interact. Sometimes the body is just a limb, sometimes it stops. Um, sometimes the figures support each other, interact, and sometimes they're, they're not. And then from there, I just start adding washes with colors that I knew I wanted to play with and then building on blocking and reacting and just trying to continue to surprise myself with the colors I put down. So these two paintings are the two that finished off my BFA thesis. Um, and I knew I wanted to finish with these conceptually before they started. So the one on the right we'll start with um, is a callback to the first painting I made then over a year earlier with the first one I showed in this presentation, um, playing again with gestures of martial arts. I know in this presentation, it seems like most of my paintings are about martial, are about martial arts, but it's really, these are like the only three I've done. Um, so it's good to revisit it after a few months break. Uh, and by this point, I was really playing with uh, experimenting in paint application and kind of rough mark making versus solid lines and uh, different washes and kind of playing with the unfinished um, and with more abstraction as well. So it's not just the kind of the clear figures that I was doing before. Um, in this case, it was maybe a fist brings you in or maybe you can see an eye and then it kind of challenges the viewer to continue to search for other, for other um, figures. And then the one on the left, I knew I wanted to finish with a solo figure looking back at the viewer. Um, a big part of my work is also playing with viewers' perception of the body. Uh, a big part conceptually that I think about is the body perceived and performed as women are socialized to often perceive their body all the time. We're kind of always shown uh, ourselves through the lens of media, through um, magazines and advertisements and uh, social media nowadays of being just a thing to be consumed and perceived. So I play with that idea and plus with the history of art um, presenting female figures as just kind of a pretty painting. Uh, I play with that idea of like pulling the viewer in with these vibrant colors and kind of abstract shapes to ask them to search for what they're looking at, having an idea of a body without giving them the full body that they normally expect um, and having the colors be warm and inviting, but also maybe too vibrant and pushes 
pushing them back. Uh, so with that all being said, this final gesture or this final painting, I wanted a gesture to kind of um, act as clear defiance and also just knowing, like, I know you're watching um, because often I, I feel like I get the sense that the women that are presented and a lot of the media we consume, it's as if they are unaware of the viewer's eye. Um, but this painting, I wanted it to represent that. I know you're looking at um, me in this painting. So, and I also just formally wanted to figure out what happens when I have one figure and what happens to the space around it. So I rotated the canvas a lot, um, played with washes and continued to react to colors. So these two paintings were also made uh, a little before the past ones during the same time period uh, last spring. But uh, it kind of shows the difference in scale. So the one on the left is three feet by four feet. And the one on the right is much smaller, about like a little over a foot um, by like 10 inches, say. And uh, I had the, the one on the right I did first. Um, and I just had a blank canvas in my studio and extra paint. And I just wanted to like get some, I was kind of stuck in a bigger painting and I was just like roughly going through um uh, trying to get something on this canvas and I just kept throwing paint at it and it ended up being one of my favorite paintings and I was looking at this small one and thinking there's so much looseness here and so much play with the application that I really want in my big paintings so it this smaller normally I feel like small scale paintings were restricting to me but this one really allowed me to get to the the one on the left so then I graduated um, and I lost my studio because I wasn't in art school anymore, but I was at the university for an extra year for my MBA. So I was in the business world. It was my master's of business administration. Um, and it was a tough time. It was going from really collaborative, creative environment to rigid, um, very male dominated, corporate-y, jargony, business world that I didn't really want to be in any way. Um, and so my work shifted to smaller scale paper works. Um, and these were made over like six months that I was in school there, uh, kind of gave me a lot more inspiration um, with environments and spaces to pull from. But I also realized that working at a smaller scale kind of limited my ability to express abstractly and gesture through the body. So the works became much more explicit in what I initially might sketch in a big painting. Um, and I felt if they get abstract, it wouldn't be, it's not really authentic. I'm not really gesturing. It doesn't feel as embodied. It, um, the works just naturally kind of progress to this more uh, representational style. But after my first semester, I got more space. Uh, so this painting is on the panel, four feet by four feet. And I just think it's an interesting progression from some of the work I made in springtime with kind of light, bright yellows and stuff um, compared to purples and lime greens and dark blacks. Um, and this was kind of inspired by that first semester of business school with the blocking um, of colors and to echo the rigidity of the program um, with also this kind of heaviness and draining and drippiness of the paint. Um, also your early 20s, I'm sure a lot of other times in your life, but I was going through it for the first time in my early 20s of a season of my life where there's a lot of goodbyes to what you know and new friends and old friends and a lot happens all at once and then it all goes away. Um, so this painting was just kind of reflecting on all of that. And I don't think I would have gotten there without painting small for a bit. So here are some other works I made around those months. Um, they were on paper and they kind of merged this really small works to the bigger works. Um, they're acrylic paintings on paper. Um, they're a little over two feet by like one and a half feet. Um, and I found myself here just sticking with the solo figure. Um, this was a series thinking about different points in my life, kind of realizing how I, am a girl and growing into womanhood and what kind of that, those different realizations of your expectations to be that are um, and how your body is morphed and pushed um, and how it, how it should be altered. So at that time too, I lived alone in an apartment for a year. So I got to, at college, I was very much surrounded by people all the time. And I had a lot of time to think about loneliness. And this was also COVID time. So 
um, I started unknowingly, I started a series of uh, female figure alone in an apartment uh, in an abstract way. So these two paintings I made like within a few weeks of each other, I wanted to make, I wanted to, to see what would happen if I made the same painting with different materials. So the one on the left is a oil pastel drawing with different layerings. Um, and then the one on the right is water-based paint. And these were the first two iterations of those. Um, one night feeling angry, one night feeling sad, and and um, how I could use like the similar parts of the color wheel with um, blue, purple, and green, but with different warm tones and how that would shift the mood. Um, I, again, tend to make paintings at different times that really go together. So these, uh, I didn't intend to be a duet, but I guess they are. Uh, and it also is interesting to me how when my work gets smaller, um, while the figure it's themselves and the gestures get much more representational to what they are, the space around it and the shapes um, kind of can stay abstract while hinting at real life space. So this, like these patterns are clearly a grid, but maybe it's a net or maybe it's um, like a bathroom tile or different interpretations of that. And lastly, I just wanted to close off with um, two current paintings in progress. These aren't the best pictures they're taken um, at night, not in natural light, but um, these are on paper and playing now with merging oil pastels, which is a big um, medium I was working with in the past year, along with other water-based paints um, and different gestures, thinking about different ideas. Um, and that's where I'm currently at. So thank you all. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, I do. Um, so let me let me wrap my head around it. <laughs> I, mean, I had all these thoughts during this. <laughs> no, that's how I felt um, about yours too. <laughs> yeah. So like your your work is is based on movement. When you translate that movement onto or into your work how important is it to communicate that actual movement or like imply the the energy and and how you feel in the body like what is that correlation yeah that's a good question um because I can't like whenever I have a mood that I want to portray just a simple to simplify it to mood if I'm feeling lazy that day and I want to make a painting say I want to make a painting about laziness or dance about laziness um I would it always starts with the body for me so it would always start with um just a very short improv with dance of how does that feel um and when I'm painting it I I take that knowledge and kind of feeling that I kind of got into my body and put it in through the gestures that are already kind of in there um but I know that as I paint, I also, the gestures are first, so they could get lost easily. So um, I try to continue to build on that through mark making. So if it's if it's a painting with a lot of energy that I want to uh, portray, I'll I'll make sure the my, I'm close to the brush, like it's not a long brush and it's quick and it's fast um, versus maybe a more lazy painting. Like I was saying an example before, I might use a longer brush, um, get a lot more medium on it to really water it down and have it more like softly drip onto the canvas um, and slowly like let itself take over the space and spread versus like directly swiping it across. Um, so that then comes in after like it's in my body and kind of expressed through sketches, then it comes into play in a different way through paint application. Um, but also like if someone looks at my lazy painting and thinks it's super full and fun and full of energy and looks like a jumping painting, then then that's okay. <laughs> so it's it's part of my my practice, but you know, we all can see it differently. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? I had more of a comment. Um, I loved how you talked about the abstraction of your work as related to the scale, especially of your larger scale work of how um, with that kind of scale, you really get the power of the difference between what people see 
from afar versus what they see close up and um, how that really influences the viewer to keep looking and keep their eyes moving. And um, you get a lot of that with your gestures as well of the, of the um, people in your paintings. And that was, that was really interesting. Uh, it was also fascinating to hear how dance is such a part of your process. That was, that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, dance is um, the first thing I've really ever like loved and knew as a creative form. Um, and I'm really glad that I get to explore it now um, and have it be so integral to the paintings. Um, so yeah, they definitely feed off of each other because I'll make dances separately too. And it's it's interesting to see how they can kind of help each other out. That's really cool. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? All right. Well, well sorry. let me just ask one, add one more comment. Go for it. Yeah. In, in the best way possible, I'm trying to think about how I want to say it. Like some of the first few painting that you showed and um, there were a lot of bodies and like, there's a very specific gesture. Um, I, that, that, image is like in that that's like in the background of my head the entire time because the, those paintings feel like the way you talk and <laughs> I, I find that really interesting like it's like gesturally like it's the way you present um that's so that was really yeah. yeah that's cool to hear that um <laughs> you can see how I am in, in the paintings themselves um that's cool yeah I love that I can totally see that now that you say that. I love that <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no other questions, we'll move forward. But Kaylee, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you. All right. Our last artist today is Dina Page Fisher. Dina, I'll read your bio and then hand it over to you. Dina Page Fisher is a multidisciplinary artist born and raised in New York City to parent to artist parents. Informed by imagery from the subconscious, spirituality, and nature, she creates mixed-media sculptures, paintings, and drawings that fuse contrasting forms and materials in a complementary way. Combining natural and industrial matter such as metal, wood, stone, concrete, and plaster, along with imagery that fuses bodily features with abstract shapes, Paige Fisher utilizes the ability of the inanimate object to embody, in essence, spirit or ethos. Paige Fisher's work has been exhibited at the Untitled Space, the Unruly Collective, Temporary Agency, and the Triskelion Arts Center in New York City, Color Works in Troy, New York, Deep Space Gallery in New Jersey City, New Jersey, Micah Brown Center in Baltimore, Maryland, and the Carolyn Glasgow Bailey Foundation in Ojai, California, the Via Caproni in Rome, Italy. Her work has been mentioned in publications such as The New Yorker and the Jersey the Jersey City Times. Paige Fisher received her BFA from the Maryland in Institute College of Art in 2009 and currently lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. All right, Dina, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, it was so cool to hear you guys talk because um, I just resonate with everything you both said so much. And it's so interesting to like see how you put all the work together and then get to see the faces and humans who created it and um, there's so much connectivity so I appreciated the way you curated, curated this and um, I really enjoyed hearing you guys all right so I'm gonna um, okay so um, I'm just kind of focusing on the work that's in this show um, right now, and I wanted to sort of share how I get to the pieces that are the um, ones in the show today. So uh, this is a wall of my studio, and I kind of keep all like the pieces and parts and objects that I find and collect and things that I've like sort of just like put together for momentary purses, purposes. And um, I kind of just spend time with them and spend time looking at them. And I've always been really 
fascinated by objects. And even as a little kid, like I was obsessed with this, you know, outlet, like multiple outlet things or like a, a chair and these objects would like have this personality or character that lived within them. And in my imagination, um, you know, they like came from this other world. So I think that these parts and um, materials that I start with, I almost, there's like this being or spirit within the materials that I'm trying to find as I put things together and take things apart and combine and um, yeah, just really interested in how things move and the gesture of sort of inanimate objects. Um, so this is a video of my studio because I wanted to show like these are these pendants or pendulums that are hanging and I sort of just like to watch the way they move and in my head it's almost like these objects are talking to each other and having these conversations. Um, so a lot of it's about movement and the way things sort of bend and hang. Um, and again, it's just spending time with these objects and, and like, sort of like seeing where they want to go or what they want to be. Um, and then I do these drawings of them. And I, I think of them as studies. It's, uh, these are three studies. And one is like a study of an object turning or a study of an object vibrating um, or a, the study of an object revolving and just seeing like how they move in the space, seeing like the lines that are left when, you know, an object starts bouncing. Um, I just, it helps me like understand the forms and the way these objects move and exist in the world. So these are the drawings that I did um, of these objects. Now you can see the right thing, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, so these are the drawings I did of these objects, these studies um, where I'm like figuring out their lives in the space. And I do these with like watercolor um, and like mixed media. Uh, and then I, this is another uh, painting I did where I was um, almost thinking of like these objects and shapes as like characters in a play and um, being on a stage set and thinking about them in a very abstract way, but also like they have personalities and they're interacting with each other. And, um, you know, they're in this other world that is like a cross between, you know, like fantasy and whatever. And then here I'm starting to add like some features from the body, but kind of halfway in, halfway out, sort of enjoying the way that these images exist between representation and abstraction. Um, and like, I almost think of it as like these, like that red and yellow, those two brush strokes in the back are almost like these characters in the background. And when I look at this, it's like red and yellow are having a conversation in the background. And even though they're just these lines, something's going on there and they're talking to each other. And, um, I, you know, the viewer can sort of like feel something coming out of them. Um, because one thing that really resonated in the description of this show was when Katie, you said um, that when you take away the features of a face, you're left with the emotion of a form. And I think that that's something that I really uh, resonate with because to me forms with or without features or details can portray so much. Um, 
And then this is more of a stream of consciousness drawing where, again, like abstraction is playing into representation and um, it's very like fluid and um, open to interpretation. And then I start like taking the parts and pieces that I have made and um, playing with them. Uh, the, this leg, like each of these little pieces, when I have arranged them kind of interact with each other and become these, again, characters, but brought to life now in sculptural form. Um, and I love like the information that certain parts of the body can hold within them. So it's like these legs on this piece of wood um, have such an awkwardness to them. Like they're so in between, you know, standing and walking and they're pigeon toed and the knees buckle and there's this grotesqueness within them that I am attracted to and find humor in. Um, and then, yeah, like sort of in loving the way that, you know, these gestural lines that wire makes are reminiscent of like, you know, upside down legs, like possibly like someone in the midst of a cartwheel or with their arms up. Um, and then also the idea of these objects having function is important to me. This dog that's connected to this handle, wooden handle is actually an incense burner. Um, and a piece of incense goes in the dog's mouth. And when it's lit, it becomes this ritual that incorporates like the senses and smell and um, the burning of something. And so I love to think of it as like, you know, these objects gathering around this ritual taking place. And then um, this is a piece that I called El Toro. Um, and these parts of this piece were sitting in my studio for like years, some of them. Um, and that's kind of how I work. I like collect things that speak to me in some way or have some something going on within them that um, I wanna, that I feel connected to or I wanna extract. Um, so this uh, came together and yeah, just like reminded me of this animal and uh, the, the little dark circle is actually frankincense. So again, it becomes this thing that you can smell and um, almost wonder where it comes from and what its purpose was or uh, yeah, like why it exists. And then um, this is a sort of jumble of a lot of my work, because again, being interested in the way that these objects interact with each other or this like overwhelm. I think that being from New York, everything's always so chaotic. Every Like there's like rubble everywhere. And I always find like beauty in these piles of trash or, you know, things that have been broken that I, uh, imagine what their lives were like before and I sort of instill these like characteristics into them so this is again sort of representing my aesthetic of this clutter um and seeing interactions within these pieces and then this is one of the pieces in the show uh I more recently started uh, including my own body into the work and marrying um, like my features with these abstract forms almost as a way of like coming to terms with like who I am or what I am or what is my form and function. Um, 
as the artist. And um, so this is a, a self-portrait I made in clay and then cast, and then um, cast mul in multiple different ways, leaving out different um, features, and then, you know, connecting it to this abstract shape where it's like, could be a torso or it could be, you know, a head slumping over. Like there are so many different forms that this abstract form takes and different stories it can tell in my mind. So there's like movement within the stillness because of all the different ways it could go for me. Um, and this is another piece that was in the show where, again, I feel like to me, there's like a sadness to it and, but also this comedy um, and with only, you know, showing certain parts of the body uh, and like piled on top of each other. Um, and then this was the last piece that I wanted to show. And um, again, I used my face that I cast in concrete. Um, and this piece, there is like so much duality for me. There's like this tension and it's like this heavy weighted head on this, um, you know, very minimal line and held together by these zip ties, which I love like the impermanence of. It's like, it's just a second away from being cut open, but it's also so sturdy at the same time. So there's this duality of like balance and weight and, lightness and um I love that moment where it's like you think everything's going to topple over but it doesn't and um sort of that ambivalence of you know not knowing what's going to happen and uh that's also a way I work in my studio is like piling things on top of each other and then it crashes and everything breaks and then I have to figure out if I want to throw those pieces out or if I want to like put them into another a new piece so um yeah I think this piece is very reminiscent of like how I'm working now which is finding a place where it looks finished in its unfinished form and vice versa, a place where it's like, you can't really tell. And that's like how I want it to live. So um, yeah, that's it. I'm sorry that I couldn't make it full screen, <laughs> but I hope you could get an idea of what I'm doing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Um, I have, I have some questions. I feel like it might be more of my thoughts first, but I just think it's really interesting that you kind of are playing with, it's like you're drawing in 3D, like especially with this one, how you um, expressed how it's like this heavy head on a thin line. Um, as you're building these, do you ever, do you think of them as like sculptures in any way? And then how does that, um how do these 3d like uh figures or 3d landscapes sometimes i was seeing it as a 3d um objects translate to helping or playing with your painting um uh, your painted pieces on 2d yeah that's um that's a great question because i definitely think of my sculptures as drawings and um I think drawing was my first way. Like I started drawing from a very young age and it's always how I've expressed myself. So um, that definitely transfers into my work with the wire because I love just the way a single line can have so much information in it and have so much gesture. But um, yeah, sometimes I think it's almost like when I'm, doing the painted pieces, that's 
again, I call them like studies, even though they're, they're finished form, but it's like, they can't be real until I bring them into the space with me almost. Um, not to say that they're, you know, less important than the sculptures, but it's like, I still have something I have to figure out that I haven't quite, you know, gotten to until it's something that I can touch and play with in my hand. Yeah. I also was wondering um, about your process in getting objects. Do you do you go out searching for them or do is it like you kind of have this collection that were just kind of happenstance and then you see the objects in your studio and you get inspired by those? Um, and then when you go out looking, do you know exactly what you're looking for or is it kind of intuitive and then you take them back to make something? Yeah, it's like, well, I am so, like, I love being in nature. My parents have a house upstate that I've been going to like every year since I was a kid. And it's really like, I'm really, I feel like informed by like natural shapes and forms that I find in nature and it's like it's funny you ask that because I have this um this hand that I cast right and like I was walking and it broke because I cast it and it broke and then I was walking in the park and I found this and I looked down and I'm like that looks like a finger and then I brought it home and I just zip tied it to the hand and I was like oh that's done like <laughs> you know that's done and sometimes it just happens so quickly like that yeah. and sometimes I you know I work something you know forever but it's mm -hmm. like yeah I definitely collect things and then hang on to them and let them sort of sit around for quite a while and then suddenly it's like oh this is what that that purpose was right so yeah I love that it's it's almost like when you talk about it like you spend time communing with them like yeah definitely just in your space before and getting their energy before you figure out how they transform into your art that's it's really fascinating how you talk about them yeah no that yeah that's exactly <laughs> what happened <laughs> That was a the that was that has been a question in my head as you were going through your presentation of how like each object has an energy has a story and then then you also kind of in your in your sketches and your drawing like you also then assign them a narrative and then they kind of build another another narrative then they form this story and I'm curious as to like do you hold on to the story and the energy or the narrative of those objects and as you rearrange them are you because like the way you were talking it's like really whimsical it's like this there's like a lot of inner child energy of like of like these objects have like their own lives and I want and I was wondering like when you put them together because I feel like your practice is like really like composition formally driven and they're like the objects have all the story and energy and narrative and then then the piece is like beautiful and finished and like and like I even they look like drawings and I wonder like it, does that narrative of those individual object carries into as you assemble this new form does it form another story is it telling a visual story um and sorry no. <laughs> so many questions <laughs> and, you like are casting and putting yourself in it um because of that that inner child that that you have like the these objects have stories and like sometimes folks would assume those are the story that you assign to them so in a way they are also telling your story but in your finished objects like I want to know your story and how like you or like how you interpret that objects is new narrative because you've created a new form sorry this is like a, oh. a me rambling oh no did I froze I froze your voice didn't no, yeah, we can still hear you um <laughs> well I can answer both parts of that separately one is that um 
I'm not attached to the stories that are coming into my head. They're very like, there's like a whimsicalness to them that's not like any serious sort of thing that I'm attached to that doesn't change. It's sort of just like my way of playing with them. And, um, you know, as, as I move things, the story changes. And as somebody else looks at them and says what they see, it changes. So it's like, I want it to be open. I don't want it to be like something that's set in stone. Um, I think when the pieces are fine, like in their final form, I, the, they tell their story, like their stories, not the one that I had in my head. It's like its own thing. And it's as much of a surprise to me as it is, you know, it's not anything that I meant for it to be, but with this, period of like putting myself into it I think that it is much more about me grappling with my own body and being able to look at myself and spend time with myself as I'm spending time with these objects like um because I don't think I before doing that I almost avoided looking at myself or putting anything personal into the work and I wanted to just say abstract and like, no, you decide what it's going to be because I don't want to like share what I'm talking about yet. And I think I'm moving closer to, you know, being like, well, here is, you know, my story. So, yeah, it's been an interesting thing looking at myself in these pieces um, and seeing the face change and not really totally recognizing that image all the time I don't know if that answered you <laughs> yeah I, I really love how like you approach your body in an abstract way like you remove like you cast it or whatever like it's then not it's you but not you then you can process like a lot of like it's how I think about trauma like you gotta have some space then you can like think about it and probably process what you're going through and that's like I'm yeah I, it, that's what it sounds like to me but I could just be projecting yeah and our bodies are such abstract things like it's like when you look at them if you have ever looked at your face in the mirror for a long period of time it starts to shift and change and your hands are not your hands they're these weird things and like your like feet are so weird and you know like there's such weird parts of our body that like it's just as you look at them or move them, like I love, um, you know, he hearing you talk about movement because it's like it, we become abstract mm -hmm. when we move and um, when we look at ourselves. So. That was interesting to me. Every time I do these, these group artist talks, it's always fascinating to me the way that the art speaks to each other. I mean, obviously I, I get a lot out of that as being as I create these shows, but even the ones that I don't, where we have like a guest juror and things like that, the way the art speaks, it's been fascinating to me to hear how the performance arts sort of work into every one of your artwork in a different way. And that's that's been really, really cool. It was not something I think I expected coming into this. I do have a question for all of you partially just because whenever um, we were going into this show, and Dina, you talked about it just a little bit, a lot of the concept of the show was about what does the portrait say or what does the form say when the features of the face are obscured? And um, obviously, whenever I was looking to curate the show, I was looking for artists who were creating artwork that really spoke to me in that kind of a way. I would love to hear what that means for each of you in your artwork. Yeah, like, or I'll just go like, first. Why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I I do not paint faces in all of our all of my figures. It's really a serious um, conceptual choice to make. Um, not that I can't. They're just not there um, because they're always so personal. They're all my experience. They're my embodied experience. But because I am sharing them, you know, if I was just to paint for myself and not show them, then they would be me 
but because I'm sharing them, I'm trying to connect through my work. And in order for me to do that is to just speak about the experience and not from me specifically. This work isn't just about me. I'm trying to reach you too. And I hope that the work also reflects in the experience of the viewer. And that's why the faces are left out. Yeah, um, I, I really like that, Sabrina. And I kind of have overlapping reasonings um, from my work as well. So my work, because it started with a being about movement, I wanted some of that abstraction came from trying to represent movement. But as I continued to work, you saw the like kind of erasure of faces very quickly. It was present in the first painting and then went away. Um, and actually the also what went away from faces is also like the essence of the female body because I was painting about myself that started that way and then I took it away. And then I was just painting figures generally and they were more because I was focusing more on movement at the time. But um, then when I paired the concepts back in, I realized I can't speak for all people. I can't even speak for all women. I can only speak for me. So they became, and I did forget to mention this, they became self-portraits, um, but in a very abstracted way, because for similar reasons, it's, I, I still don't want it to be, I'm not telling a specific story, even though it might start from a specific memory. Um, it's really still about the uh, abstract expression of the paint and uh, the interaction of colors and the way that movement in a body, specifically mine, is presented um, and how I feel about it being presented through paint. Yeah, I mean, it was like reading the description of the show, I was like, oh, well, this is exactly what I'm working with. I'm quite literally, you know, removing parts of the face within every cast that I'm making. And every time I do that, the result is so shockingly different it's like if you leave out the eyes it's gonna look so different tell such a different story than if you leave out the mouth or you know it's like um these subtle changes are so important and um just really inform what the work is about so um yeah I think that that was, um, it was really great for me to uh, be part of this show and, and be able to talk about, and also it really inspired me to think about more about what, you know, the importance of the features or lack thereof. And, you know, um, uh, thinking about like the body and form and also language, you know, and how those all play into each other. Yeah, I've never gotten to talk directly with two artists that work in very similar ways with um, kind of abstracting the body. So this is really cool to hear both of you talk about it. This has been really cool for me too. And like I said, this is one of my favorite shows of this year. I really enjoy being able to curate these shows that are very much specific to a thought or a feeling it usually starts with me writing something and then it sort of evolves into what it is. Um, I think Dina, you, your work was the last work that came in because we were, I was, it was like a week before the show and I contacted Dina and was like, something is needed in this show. And I think it's you. And I, I think um, it, the way it's all come together has been very exciting. Um, all of your work is so different. The mediums you're using are so different, but seeing it all together is just really exciting for me. So I appreciate so much all of you coming and telling us about your stories, about your work um, and sharing your work with us in this virtual space, because I know that's a very different thing too. But um, yeah, oh, this has been so cool. Such a wonderful experience with all of you. And does anybody have any other questions or comments or anything before? Yeah. I just want to say like thank you because this is such a safe space to um, speak about and share the work and it was also just it's so nice to always see your work alongside another artist and I think it's a treat to be able to do that so far away from each other um, mm -hmm. so I really enjoyed like talking to you guys like here and also seeing our work 
speak with each other in the space. And mm -hmm. I appreciate you putting it together, Katie. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we will go ahead and wrap up for today if nobody else has anything that they want to say. But once again, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you all being a part of this show. I love how your work speaks to each other in the virtual space. It is, it's just so cool to me every time that those things come together. And it's, it's been so cool to have more 3D pieces in this particular show and see how that worked together. It's, it's just so much fun to me getting to do these things like I said I have a background in um, graphic design and photography and so like bringing all of that together is one of the joys to me <laughs> but it's really cool whenever we can get together and hear the stories behind the work and see the faces behind the work and that's a really special part of what we're doing so I appreciate it so much yes Thank you, thank you everyone. It was great talking. Yes. Yes. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to everyone who's joined us and who will be joining us and watching later on on YouTube. Um, yeah. If you have not seen the scene exhibition and you're watching this before January 17th, 2023, go to roaringartistgallery.com and uh, make sure that you do. It's, it's just a really cool experience and I'm so excited to be able to bring it into the world so thank you all so much all right we'll see you later bye, bye.